All active on NATO's eastern flank. At Poland's Zagang base, a warm welcome for the largest U.S. military reinforcement in Europe in decades, more than 25 years after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Their arrival is part of Operation Atlantic Resolve, demonstrating the U.S.'s commitment to the alliance, much to the relief of those gathered here. This is America's most capable fighting force, a combat-ready, highly trained U.S. armored brigade with our most advanced equipment and weaponry. This force embodies America's ironclad commitment to honor our NATO treaty obligation to defend our NATO allies. 3,500 troops make up the U.S. deployment. They came accompanied by more than 80 battle tanks as well as hundreds of armored vehicles. A unit will rotate through the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, as well as Bulgaria and Romania, conducting exercises and setting up a headquarters in Germany. But further east, in Moscow, a storm of condemnation. Russia views the presence of US troops so close to its territory as saber-rattling. And it's responded in kind. War games in Serbia as NATO conducted exercises in neighboring Montenegro. And it's already deployed surface-to-air missiles in Kaliningrad, Russia's enclave that sits between Poland and Lithuania, a move that increased already simmering tensions in the region. Russia and China have again expressed concern over the deployment of a U.S. missile system to South Korea. The Russian Foreign Ministry has stated that deploying the THAAD missile system to the Korean Peninsula is, quote, destructive and could damage regional stability. The statement follows six rounds of talks between Moscow and Beijing on the security of Southeast Asia. During the talks, both delegations stressed that the situation developing on the peninsula has a high potential of conflict. Diplomats also said some countries are seeking to further heighten tension and boost the arms race in the region. Washington and Seoul say the deployment of the missile system is to deter threats from North Korea. Speaking at his annual press conference, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov poured scorn on U.S. intelligence claims that Russia hacked the Democratic Party's servers during the U.S. election campaign in order to influence a pro-Trump outcome. It's not for me to prove any of this is false. As far as I know, there's a presumption of innocence. So it's up to you to prove it's true. It's the same people who fail to create universal rules to bestow order on the media and who fail to consolidate efforts to fight cyber fraud. They're the ones accusing us, without any proof, of taking almost the entire world under our control. Lavrov also spoke about the deployment of some 4,000 U.S. troops in Poland and NATO exercises in Estonia, close to the border with Russia. If NATO power structures could not think of better ways to use its forces, rather than in Estonia on the border with Russia, it means its intelligence is doing a poor job. It means that NATO doesn't understand what's going on in other parts of the world, parts of the world that are under NATO responsibility. Russia's top diplomat urged the European Union to help reduce tensions in Kosovo by calling on the withdrawal of ethnic Albanian troops from the Serb-populated areas in the north. The cold snap is tightening its grip, claiming more than 65 lives across Europe, causing traffic chaos, power cuts and travel delays. This is Sarajevo. The Balkans have been particularly hard hit. Temperatures have been as low as minus 15 for several days. 
There's major concern about the plight of refugees, particularly in Serbia. Some are being sheltered in reception centres, but 1,200 are living in a derelict warehouse in Belgrade, according to the UNHCR. It's very cool and we are, we are just making fire, but still we can keep warm ourselves. We need to have facility, but we don't like to stay here. We are trying to get, we are trying to leave this country and go to European countries, but we are stuck because of the border. There are calls for governments across Europe to do more. It will only take one more snowstorm or another cold snap uh, and we're going to see some some children, you know, in a very dire situation. Children are particularly prone to respiratory illnesses at a time like this. We do not want to see this happen. It's about saving lives, not about red tape and keeping to bureaucratic arrangements at the moment. River traffic along the Danube, one of Europe's main waterways, has largely been suspended in Eastern Europe due to the ice. And the warning is that more bad weather is on the way. Simon Jones, BBC News. Of the thousand or more males living in total squalor in central Belgrade, the vast majority are young, and many of the young are under 18. So, are they children, or are they not? Look at this 10-year-old Afghan boy, like a figure from Dickensian London. Mother of girls. Uh -huh. And your father? Of girls. No parents with him. He's the nephew of another man in his group. With, with his family here, or by, by himself? Which family? family? Not a family either. No. no. Only alone. alone. Or this 13-year-old huddled round the fire, again with men not his father. They all have something in common. Their parents sent them to Europe. Miriana spends her time trawling the camp for children she can offer help to, but since she started doing it, she learns something lost on many in the West. It is true that their parents forced them to leave home because they wanted to save their lives, but these children, they told us that in their culture, at their age, their parents don't consider them children. It isn't the same as here. Mariana found one boy of six who'd made the journey alone. In the queue for food, you look at their faces, and the line between teenage and adult blurs immediately. They assume they are refugees who should be working in Europe. For them, age is a detail. <laughs> An SOS from the UN about the fate of millions of people in Yemen facing hunger and a need of protection. The UN's humanitarian coordinator for Yemen has held a media conference to raise the alarm over conditions getting worse in the country after war erupted in 2014. There's about 11 million people in this country who need some sort of protection in terms of human rights. Uh, to protect their dignity and their safety and uh, there's another 2.9 million living in acutely affected areas uh, who require legal and other types of support. Some of them are related to being displaced people, some of it related to gender-based violence. The UN says the number of civilians killed in the conflict is now estimated to be more than 10,000 with some 40,000 injured. But it says that's only according to figures collated by local hospitals, and the actual death toll may be much higher. I just want to show what is happened when one Christian man walk through through the Muslim country, and uh, the experience is great. afraid against these people because uh, also the media make a very bad picture from this crisis and they make a bad picture against the, the Muslim people. Walking is very, it's beautiful, it's beautiful experience because when you walk, you have a time to to learn a lot about one country. You meet a lot of person, but also you have a lot of time to think who who are you, to travel inside yourself. And I think that this is the most important thing to so walk.
police used tear gas and live ammunition to disperse demonstrators. More than a dozen people have been injured in the latest clashes. While the rallies were held in towns and villages across the country, protesters blocked roads and burned tires, calling for the prosecution of the Al Khalifa regime for its crimes. Syrian government forces and their allies are pounding the valley of Wadi Barada. It's one of a few besieged areas the rebels still hold around the capital Damascus, and this one has extra significance for the government. The wadi has lots of water and is the main supply for the capital and surrounding areas, but recent fighting has damaged the water treatment plant, leaving at least five million Syrians with little access to water. But warring sides accuse the other of damaging the plant. The UN says water supply is a main element of concern and negotiations are underway to come to some form of agreement for engineers to go into the rebel-held area and repair the damage. Two meetings are taking place, both in Ankara and now probably in Moscow too, which will be discussing this aspect because two reasons. The first one, water in Damascus is vital and B, because it's affecting 5 million people, and B, because it does have potentially, if it escalates, an impact on the Astana at the talks and meeting, which is based, as you know, on the concept of a well-established, potentially even better established, cessation of hostilities. Barrel bombs dropped by government aircraft have targeted the area for weeks. Some people are leaving the valley. The UN says five villages have reached agreement with the government, but not two others, including the village with the water plant. The opposition says it wants all attacks to stop and for a guarantee that the rebels won't be forcibly evacuated to the northern province of Idlib. Under previous agreements, rebels have been moved from besieged areas around the capital to Idlib, and the opposition says that equates to forced displacement. Government leaders in Damascus are keen to clear the last rebel-held areas around the capital now that Aleppo is back in their hands. Buried in snow, barely visible, this is the hotel hit by Wednesday night's avalanche. Inside, the extent of the damage is becoming clear. What looks like a reception leading to corridors now unrecognisable, full of snow and debris. Up to 20 people were staying in the Hotel Rigo Piano, along with seven members of staff but bad weather meant a difficult overnight rescue operation. The hotel was reached at 4.30 in the morning by courageous men who faced unbearable situations. They reached the place and saved two people. They are now working to bring the means of transport that are difficult to bring. On skis in the early hours of Thursday morning, rescue teams faced snowstorms to get to the area hit. With routes blocked to emergency vehicles, only manpower could save those trapped. One man is led to safety. People are suffering through the third severe flood in less than two weeks in Argentina's Santa Fe province. In total, they've had up to 800 millimetres of rain in a month in some parts more than the region would normally get in a year. The rain began this morning around 6 o'clock and it rained all day. While some residents tried to clear their homes of the rising water, others got stuck on a national highway as traffic became blocked by the flood. The fire services stepped in to evacuate hundreds of people, some who'd been trapped in their homes, even as the fire station became inundated with water. In some countries, it's the lowest temperatures in more than 50 years, causing misery for residents and headaches for authorities. Countries in Eastern Europe and the Balkans have been hardest hit, with more than 70 deaths caused by the freezing weather. For example, in Albania, at least eight people have died as snow fell for the first time in resort towns in the south of the country. Rare heavy snowfall has been seen in many places, including Dubrovnik in Croatia. 
What looked to be a typical mild winter suddenly changed overnight, catching authorities and the public by surprise. Further west in Europe, alerts have been in place for snowstorms and flooding, including here in Scotland. Disruption to travel is widespread, with many schools also closed. The UN Refugee Agency has also voiced concern about how refugees and migrants are coping in the freezing conditions, saying governments must do more to help them. Apparently, what happened was that it started, the fire started at 7.30 in the morning. We presumed there were some people inside it, but the authorities tried to evacuate the area and the neighboring areas. It's around the corner from the British embassy, from the German embassy, from the Turkish embassy. And then they did manage to put out the fire, or they thought they had. And then the more firefighters went in, more even civilians, people who had businesses there, went in to check and then suddenly the whole thing collapses again after the fire restarted. The future is looking very grim for some of our fellow primates. According to a new study, more than half of Earth's non-human primate species, including monkeys, lemurs, and apes, are facing the threat of extinction. And about three quarters of primates have declining populations. The shrinking numbers have researchers concerned. As one of the study's authors put it, this truly is the 11th hour for many of these creatures. Habitat loss, the illegal pet trade, hunting, and climate change are just some causes behind the decline. And those threats have one thing in common, humans. An author of the study says unless conservation becomes a global priority, many of the world's primate species will disappear in the next 25 years. The researchers say Brazil, Indonesia, Madagascar, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo currently host two-thirds of all species of primates. They say conservation efforts in these areas could stop or even reverse the global primate extinction trend. On the eve of the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, Oxfam have released a report which sheds light on the gaping disparity between the world's rich and poor. The gap, which the charity says is continuing to widen, exposes and criticizes what Oxfam calls an indecent concentration of wealth in the hands of a tiny minority, with just eight men owning the same amount as the poorest half of the world's population. We have an economic system that's warped out of shape, which means that the 1% benefit, that it's designed to benefit the 1% rather than most people in the 99%, uh, which is why you could get the number of billionaires that have the same wealth as half the rest of the world on one golf buggy. According to the report, these eight people, Bill Gates, Amancio Ortega, Warren Buffett, Carlos Slim, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Ellison and Michael Bloomberg collectively possess more riches than the combined wealth of the world's poorest 3.6 billion people. Oxfam is calling for a crackdown on the tax-dodging and supercharged shareholder capitalism that sees the rich stay rich and the poor poor. Many, many billionaires pay hardly any tax using tax havens to hide their money away. We've got a situation where billionaires are paying less tax often than their cleaner or their secretary. That's crazy. We're seeing wealth channeled upwards. In Kenya, for example, the effects of the growing disparity between the haves and the have-nots are devastating. While the wealthiest person in the country is worth over $700 million, 42% of Kenya's population live below the poverty line. Although over 2 million are forced to work off the books without any services or protection, ironically, Kenya's economy is booming boosted by big businesses coming to Nairobi to enjoy the tax incentives that are depriving the country of vital revenue. 